Uh, it will be a sports science in high performance sport doing uh, 100 things 1% better. So Professor Cardinale, now uh, the audience is all yours and we will listen to what you have to say to us. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? That's the uh, first thing. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for the very kind uh, invitation and uh, I hope everyone is well in, uh, in your beautiful city of Belgrade and uh, from wherever you are connected. Can you see my screen now? Okay, uh, no, still, still, uh, I see just you. Just let me check one. Yeah, you are allowed to, to share your screen, but okay. still we're seeing you. Let's see. If I can share it this way. Uh, yeah, the sharing is starting now, and we can see your screen. Perfect. It's a lot, lot better than seeing me, for sure. So. <laughs> no, 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 please don't say that. I'll take the camera off so it stops the, the broadband, so you should be able to see, to see everything. Well, thanks, um, thanks again for the, for the invite and um, the willingness to listen to me <laughs> at this time of the day and, and towards the weekend. Um, first of all, why this title? Uh, why I decided to, to talk about this? Why, why I think it's important? Uh, this is a phrase that really stuck with me when I uh, was working in the UK. Uh, my boss uh, used to say this, he said, what can we do if, if everyone can do 1% better, we can win more medals by aggregation of marginal gains. And I think this sentence was then taken out of context by many journalists, but I think this is a bit the philosophy that we can use. Uh, nowadays, we work with athletes with uh, different uh, expertise, with different people. So if everyone is doing 1% better, surely we can add a lot. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, this aspect of understanding what it means first sport in the elite, uh, at elite level, Olympic level, how it is changing and why sports science is important. So the first thing to think about is that the fact that there is more and more countries that are able to win a medal of any color at the Olympic Games. Uh, there is now about 85, 86 countries that are capable of winning a medal at the Olympics. And this is a lot different from the beginning uh, of, of the modern Olympic Games, where only very few countries were able to win. Still, there is about 250 NOCs that compete. Out of them, only about 86 are capable of winning a medal of any color. But also in the Winter Olympics, the number of countries that are capable of winning medals, uh, it's increasing. You know, before... Uh, the Winter Olympics were uh, only uh, accessible in terms of medal return for uh, countries that had a clear advantage in terms of weather. And, you know, our Norwegian friends are dominating the field at the moment. But also countries with no infrastructure have been capable of winning medals at the Winter Olympics. Uh, if you think about Australia winning medals in Vancouver, three medals, uh, and Great Britain, uh, we won a medal in uh, 20. Uh, 10 in Vancouver and I think in Sochi there were about four medals for the British Olympic team despite the fact that there is no uh, winter sports infrastructure there. So things are possible. Uh, and also winning is becoming more and more difficult. This is the number of national Olympic committees that have been able to win a medal of any color uh, in the different sports in Rio Olympics and you can see that in some sports is very competitive, like in athletics, for example. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, uh, win a medal of any color because there is a, a lot of countries that are capable of winning one. Um, but also in other sports like judo, for example, or uh, taekwondo, or uh, in cycling or in uh, boxing, there's quite a lot of countries that are capable of winning medals. And the competitiveness also in sports is different between men and women. The main thing to understand is that sport is now a global phenomenon and everyone is trying to win at any level in any sport, uh, in any possible way. So for this reason, um, <laughs> For this reason, the competitiveness is increased. One other thing that we need to 
think about is also how performance is evolving uh, in different countries. Um, and that's not only because of science, actually science plays a role later on in the development. It all starts with infrastructure. So this is the cumulative proportion of top 10 performances in athletics. And as you can see from the 90s, there has been a massive increase in uh, the number of top 10s, for example, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from China. Uh, and that's because there has been an increase in the investment in the infrastructure and sport has started to be a bit more organized. So a lot of countries can now win at a very high level. So where does sports science come into this? Uh, I think it's very important to recognize that innovation in sport not always comes from scientists. Uh, in fact, we have some great examples of uh, innovation in sport that came from coaches or athletes. I think that one of the big ones is, uh, is this one with Dick Fosbury in the 1968 Olympics. He, he invented the Fosbury flop. Uh, he changed the high jump technique. And since then, has been used by pretty much everyone. There has been no innovation in terms of jumping, high jumping technique. And at the time, Fosbury didn't have uh, uh, dart fish or complex camera systems to do that. The reason why he came up with this technique, it's because he didn't have a long run in, in the gym where he was training or in the facility where he was training during the winter. So he found a solution and the solution was such that this technique is now the technique used by pretty much every jumper. And the person on the right is Gosta Holmer, which was an athlete and then later on a coach. And uh, he, he's been uh, kind of recognized as the inventor of fartlek or uh, what, what we tend to call now high intensity training. So he developed an innovative way of developing aerobic capacity or running speed or running performance just by experimenting with uh, changing speed during training sessions. So none of these guys were scientists, they came up with uh, very good solutions. And also what we need to recognize is that sometimes science was wrong. So for example, uh, 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 what happened in the Olympic games from 1928 to uh, 1964, the women were not allowed to race the 800 meter race because they were considered too weak. Uh, and this was because in 1928, apparently six out of eight entrants collapsed at the end and apparently it was a hot day. At the time, there was not much knowledge about heat. Of course, uh, probably women's sports was not that developed. Uh, so the knowledge, uh, the nutrition, the preparation was not fantastic. Uh, and then medicine decided to stop these events, uh, sports medicine or, or medicine or, or health and safety. But then in the 50s, uh, it was reintroduced and in the first competition, they put ambulances at the finish line to be ready for casualties. So, you know, sometimes science in sport is catching up with what athletes and coaches do and, and uh, discover. Uh, the other thing we need to be aware of is the fact that uh, nowadays uh, there is a lot of uh, issues in, in high performance sports. There is lots of fads, lots of fashion, uh, I call it. Uh, and it's mostly driven by the media and commercial interests. So there is a tendency, especially in the media, to report success and attribute success in sport to some magic things or special things that athletes do. And, and very rarely there is a story of long term development of an athlete, of hard work, of prepare, preparation, of uh, you know, willingness to, to do things that are right, uh, because they don't sell journals, they don't make uh, copies. So of course, what the journalists then try to emphasize are these strange things. So in this case, was uh, I remember this article was quite funny, and they were saying that uh, Novak Djokovic wins because he has this special chair uh, we all know that the reason why he wins is because he's been training incredibly hard for a number of years and he's very well prepared he's an incredible tennis player and there is a lot of things that he does right and, and even if he does this that's not what makes him win or lose we know that very well the other thing that we should also be aware of is that you know there is a tendency for certain things to become very popular 
and then everyone follows. So for example, in the last few years, these are probably three things that became very popular in sport. One is beetroot juice or anything to do with beetroot. Thanks to the work that was done in the UK by Professor Andy Jones, uh, then suddenly beetroot or beetroot juice became popular. Before then, athletes were not even interested in beetroots. And because of some of the good results found in science, now everyone is consuming a lot of beetroot in, in various forms. Uh, vitamin D, very rarely you heard about vitamin D about 20 years ago. Uh, and then suddenly there has been a boom in uh, the publications of vitamin D, the interest in vitamin D, mostly because now it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier to measure uh, vitamin D uh, in athletes. And therefore it's easier to prescribe interventions to improve vitamin D, but also because thanks to science, we know a little bit more about the implications of vitamin D on performance. And finally, this one, uh, this is a picture from the London Olympics on K-tape, uh, quite a fascinating technique. I, I don't know how all those strips were placed there, but it's a very popular uh, thing that kind of boomed in sport um, with not much evidence that this was working and it just becomes fact and then people just follow it and, and people just do it. So we need to be aware that when we work with a certain level of athletes, these athletes and their coaches and their entourage might be exposed to a variety of things and they might have strong opinions about it. And the role of science is also sometimes to tell them that this thing is actually might not help uh, performance. The other challenge we have uh, with sports science in sport is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to be able to be up to date and follow everything. Uh, if you think about the number of publications that are published uh, every year in different topics, there, is, there has been an exponential increase. So this is just from PubMed, this is the number of articles with keywords strength, endurance and sprint. Uh, and, and you can see a few things. First of all, that since 1999, there has been a steep increase in papers on strength training and, and uh, endurance training seems not to be much of interest at the moment. And there has been a big increase in sprint training. And I think that's also driven by the fact that equipment to measure strength is now much more accessible than it was be before. So a lot of people are focusing um, research on these elements, but also because now it's recognized that strength training is an important component of preparation of the athletes, whether up to probably 20 years ago, it was considered something that would slow down the athletes and not help them uh, in their uh, performance. Uh, also, uh, I think young scientists might be a bit of victims of trends. Uh, this is an example from the number of papers on two supplements. Uh, the orange one is the creatine supplementation and the gray one is beetroot juice. There was a big number of papers around the 90s on creatine after the initial work of Eric Kultman. Uh, and creatine became a very popular supplement uh, in the 90s. And then suddenly, despite the fact that there is a lot of evidence for creatine supplementation to work, uh, it's now rarely prescribed by uh, nutritionists uh, and everyone is now prescribing or doing research on beetroot juice because it's a cool thing. It's the latest uh, fashion in a way. So I think it's very important to also educate younger uh, people to read papers that were done before and understand that something that does work, it always works. Uh, it doesn't stop suddenly to work. So not be fashion and not be fashion driven. But when you work with um, elite athletes, no matter the sport, uh, there are only three things that are important and they are called uh, gold, silver and bronze. You know, these are the only chance to get a medal around your neck at the Olympic Games. So science uh, needs to be helpful to help the people that can obtain these medals and reach those medals. Therefore, we need to take a slightly different approach when we work with these athletes. And I hope I can give you a few examples today. These people are really, really special. This is Simon Biles. Uh, I think she won about 25 medals uh, at 
world level between Olympics and world champs in the last few years. Uh, what is important to recognize is that these people are different from the people that are currently or usually used in scientific studies. Very rarely uh, it's possible to have access to this type of athletes for uh, longitudinal studies or for intervention studies and, and therefore what we know in science or what we read from scientific publications then needs to be applied to these people and sometimes it's not the same thing. So we need to recognize some of the limitations of science but we also need to, to take into consideration the fact that science can help us really have some interventions on, on these particular athletes. Things are changing a little bit. In the last few years, there has been an increase in publications on covering topics that involve interventions on elite athletes. We've done a few, so I, I will speak about that. But I think it's important to always consider the context of where sports science is applied and the context of where knowledge in sports science is uh, actually gathered. So the first thing that it's important to understand when you are working with any group of athletes at any level is to understand what you need to do to win. What does it mean? Uh, if you're working in uh, judo or if you're working in handball or if you're working in water polo, uh, it's important that you understand what the performance requirement of those sports are, uh, what are the qualities of the players, what the coaches try to achieve, how they try to achieve it and the jargon they use to do it. And for you as a practitioner, no matter what science you are delivering, so if you're delivering sports medicine, if you are delivering physiotherapy, if you are delivering nutrition, if you are delivering uh, strength and conditioning or physiology, it's important that you know very well what it takes to win. What are the fundamental aspects of that particular sport that are important to cover in order to win? And you also need to recognize that um, success in sport comes from three main pillars. One is the athlete. If you don't have good athletes, it doesn't matter how good the science is, you're not going to win anything. Uh, the coaching and support to the athlete, um, sometimes accidents happen, but without the combination of good coaching support and the athlete is challenging to win. And the level of training and competitions. And the other element that is very important to recognize is the people and process. So as a practitioner going to work into sports, no matter what, part of science you are delivering, you need to understand that you are part of a plan that involves a number of people. And what you're trying to do, you're trying to help the only person that is going to get on the podium one day, and that's the athlete. So the key understanding is that your role is actually behind. So you're not the person that is winning or losing the medal. Uh, you are the person that is actually supporting the journey and making sure that this particular person that has this talent and this willingness to achieve is reaching a podium one day and, and is winning something important for him and, and his country in the case of international competitions. So it's very important to understand where we are as practitioners. We're always behind and uh, our role is, is a supportive role. We never win or lose. We just contribute to the journey as much as we can. So where does science come? So if on one side we have the athlete and the coach and the athlete's abilities, the genetics of the athlete and the motivation, the willingness to train, to learn, and the willingness to embark on a long-term journey, support comes here on the other side. And uh, uh, support involves also, let me change color here, a big deal of coaching. So it's important to know the personality, the knowledge, the teaching abilities of the coaches and how the coaches develop the competitive attitudes. But here comes the big support, health. Health is very important. If without healthy athletes, it's impossible to have performance. It's very difficult to have performance. So they need a good diagnostic access, they need good day-to-day -day care, 
they need good physiotherapy, medicine, and psychology. And then the support from science is to optimize the training, optimize the competition, so make sure they can compete with some competitive advantage of some sort, uh, and then most of all, accelerate learning. So if, if science can accelerate the learning of the athlete, the coaches and the support staff, they might have a competitive advantage. The margins between winning and losing are incredibly tiny, are very, very, very small. And you can see here, this is the final of the 2004 Olympic Games. The difference between the person that comes first and the person that watches the other three people getting a medal, it's so tiny. And this kind of uh, uh, finish repeats itself all the time in different events. So this was the, the 100 meters uh, finish line. And this is the difference between gold and silver in uh, a rowing final of the Olympic Games in the four. And the difference between, uh, so again, this one is very important. The margins are tiny and none of these margins sometimes can be measured with uh, uh, any testing that you do on performance aspects of the athletes. So this is why sometimes a 1% gain with some sort of support might be, might be the difference between winning and losing a medal. But what we also know in uh, high performance sport is that by now analyzing performances over the years, it starts to be possible to predict what you need to do in terms of uh, being able to win a medal at the games. So this is, for example, the women's 100 meters, um, the gold, silver and bronze at every Olympic game from the 1928. This was the result in 2022. And nowadays with all the data that we have from different competitions around the world, it's kind of possible to predict what time or distance or, or um, length uh, an athlete is in particular in these sports where centimeters, grams and seconds are important, it's possible to start to predict what the athlete needs to do in order to be successful at an Olympic Games. And this is what many organizations are doing. So they are investing in uh, actually, uh, uh, they're called sports intelligence programs where they are trying to understand where it's possible to win medals and what you need to do to win them. So how do we support this? Uh, I have to say that probably in a few hundred years or uh, thousands of years, things have not changed really much. If you remember the movie, The Gladiator, uh, there was the athlete, the gladiator, which was Maximus Decimus Meridius, and the coach, the trainer was Antonius Proxima. If you've seen the movie, you can see that uh, the coach is, has got some incredible leader, leadership skills. The athlete trains every day with a bunch of other people and is eating a special diet. So things have actually not changed much. These two are still the important components of, uh, of performance. What has changed is the size and the quality of the entourage that now works with, uh, with these two. And the key person to influence always in this process or to help in this process is, is the coach. And coaches come, coaches' knowledge comes from, uh, most of the times, many coaches have been athletes in the sport that they coach. So they come with their own background, their own personal experience, their own knowledge. They go through some coaching qualifications of some sort. And the difference we have nowadays is that Coaches can learn from everywhere. So they, they can learn from uh, colleagues, they can learn from the media, they can learn from uh, internet, they can learn from magazines, um, they learn from the athletes themselves. But now they also have a number of people around them that want to give them advice. And these are the scientists or the medical teams. So you, you can understand how sometimes, even for the coaches, this can be overwhelming. So it's important that the right information is collected and the right information goes there. And ideas to improve performance are everywhere to be found. 
So one of, one of the things that I, I would like to make clear is that working with teams and, and identifying uh, uh, supporting structures is the best way to advance performance. And, and good ideas come usually by a combination of people that are involved in the process. And this was my experience in the UK. Uh, we engaged uh, a large number of people uh, doing uh, a lot of things um, to try to improve performance and find solutions. So it was not only sports scientists or sports medicine doctor, we engaged with a lot of people in the industry, engaged with a lot of people in engineering, engaged in the, with a lot of people from uh, British Aerospace, for example, and good ideas are everywhere to be found. So don't limit yourself to uh, colleagues within your area. So how do we apply science? That's a key thing. The, the first thing is we need to recognize that athletic performance, no matter the sport, is a very complex thing. It involves a variety of things. It's not only the usual ologies, physiology, biomechanics, psychology, tactics, health and lifestyle, but it's pretty much about optimizing a series of interventions to be able to improve performance. So we need to recognize the complexity of that. So this is one of the processes that I suggest or I used in the past is to first identify what it takes to succeed in each individual sport. So what's the result, the score, the distance? What do I need to do to be a top performer? Define the performance model. What are the physiological demands, the technical demands, the tactical demands? What nutrition do I need to consider? What are the psychological skills? What about the equipment? What are the competition strategies? Then determine the KPIs. What do I need to measure to make sure I know where the athlete is at any given time? I need to assess the athlete, his strengths and weaknesses, and I need to help the coaching um, team to develop the appropriate training plans and the appropriate interventions to try to improve performance. Once I have that, I can continuously review and make sure we are all on track to try to reach and achieve performance. So an example of this breakdown can be for a, a, a 800 meter runner, so if we know that these are the performance determinants on the left and we break down the physiological demands, we know that these are the physiological demands, the aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity, springing ability. We know what training interventions the coach is doing to improve all those and we know what the key performance indicators are. So by assessing those, we can go back and see how things are progressing, but also we can provide advice to the coach according to his coaching model. But when we look at the areas where we can make a difference with science, in reality, they are quite simple. Athletes should be able to do four things very well, which is eat, sleep, train, and compete. <laughs> so if we try to simplify things, these are the areas where realistically, we can make a lot of impact with uh, science. So. Uh, what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, how to eat, the technology to improve sleep, how we recover better, what are the environmental aspects, some training elements, how do we help training prescriptions and competitions, what can we do to enhance performance in competition, what equipment we can use, what measurements we can do, how do we know the opposition, how do we improve the field of play analysis, how do we feedback during the game. So these are simple areas whereby uh, making appropriate interventions is possible to improve performance. So what's the framework for science in sport? It's this. First, athlete and coach have to be at the center of what you do. Of course, there is a need of a strong leadership and support, but science comes in these three areas, I think, a lot. So, so knowledge and teaching. So science can help the athletes and the coach in developing more knowledge about what they do and how to coach the athlete better. The coaching support is about improving, for example, the strength and conditioning elements, how the athlete is recovering. And the technology and innovation can help the equipment, can help the use of specific recovery interventions, can help opposition analysis, can help feedback systems. So this is really for 
simple areas. One key thing to also understand in sport is that sometimes complex science can be translated into very simple things and it's not what you look at that matters, it's what it means. So this is an example from the Vancouver Olympics. If you have a look at these three pictures, so these are the three athletes that got the medal. So Amy Williams won gold, uh, she, she was the British uh, skeleton um, athlete. Uh, Anja Huber got the bronze medal from Germany and uh, Kerstin uh, Simobiak got the silver from Germany. So two German athletes, a British athlete. So one main thing, in Great Britain there is no uh, track for a skeleton, so this was quite an incredible result, winning gold there. But look at the difference between these three athletes. They are all at the start line, uh, putting the helmet on. This is an athlete that is taking some gear off. And, and there is a reason for that, uh, and, and I'll, I'll give you some more details later. But what tended to happen was, and this was the same at the London Olympics, everyone saw this and they tried to repeat it without understanding the science behind it. And then when you do that, it's likely that you're doing more harm than good to the athlete. And one of the examples I always use is the ice baths. Everyone nowadays is doing ice baths. Very rarely I see proper protocols for the use of ice baths and appropriate times when these ice baths needs to be used. So just because the others do something, if you don't really understand why and how to apply it properly, maybe it's not a good idea to copy other people. So let's give you some examples of why, how science can be applied in a performance setting. And I choose a few examples so you see the process behind it, but also you can see that uh, some of these things can actually be published uh, also in the scientific journal. So this was a case, the handball team, uh, which is not very good in Great Britain, uh, was worried about uh, uh, players with cramps and fatigue. Uh, so we went in in the pre-Olympic tournament and uh, we went to measure a variety of things. First of all, to see if there was a problem. Um, what we found was that, uh, you know, the, the team was drinking about a litre. The sweat loss was about a litre, more or less. There was a large uh, individual variation. But what we found and what we told the coach was that 56% of the players or in 56% of the measurements, fluid consumption was the same or exceeded sweat loss. And in 44% of the measurements, fluid loss exceeded intake. In no occasion, there was uh, more than 2% body mass loss. So we told the coach, look, it's not a big deal here. Actually, we are more worried about the fact that there is few players that are drinking way too much, a lot more than they should be drinking. And actually, by the end of the match, they are a bit heavier than they were at the beginning. So it's probably not a good idea. And one of the things that we also measured was the concentration of sodium in sweat. So in blue, you see the average of the team in terms of uh, sodium concentration and sodium sweat rate and sodium sweat rate. And the number 14 of this team uh, had um, way higher sodium concentration in sweat and a much higher sweat rate. And at the time, this player was uh, very important for the economy of the team. So the advice we could provide was an individualized uh, rehydration solution for this particular player and a rehydration plan uh, during the tournament in order for this player to be able to sustain the games longer. Now, this is how big data or, or group data are actually used to influence performance on an individual. Um, this was the sweat rate of all the individual players in each game and you can see there is a large variability. So the important thing when you work with groups is to use the scientific process to make the interventions and in this particular team we had four players that had sweat sodium concentration that were tending on the high side. So the suggestion was to do something about it with, uh, with the team, in particular the number 14. But then when the paper is published, this is what you see. Uh, you see the mean and the standard deviation around uh, um, uh, the players, you see the, the typical hydration status, you see the, the, the heart rate composition, etc. So the paper tells you how a phenomenon looks like, 
the information you use to provide an intervention to the individual athlete is what makes the difference in performance sport. So in this case and the other cases I'll show you, it started with a question from the coaching staff that we needed to answer. And then the paper was the final outcome. The real outcome was the intervention for the team. Uh, this is another example. This is a series of studies where we were trying to understand how to improve performance in uh, short track speed skating. And we were using some uh, new cool technology called near infrared spectroscopy. And what we found and what we told the coaches is that uh, oxygen uptake was not a good way to measure the progress of the athletes or understand performance demands in short track speed skating but the oxygenation in the two separate legs was more important because one leg is doing something completely different from the other. Um, in this series of studies, what also happened was that while we were measuring and adaptations to training, we found that one subject didn't have the same responses that everyone else did. And uh, this was the, highlighted by a, a possible pathology uh, in his ability to uh, uh, have blood flow to the lower limbs uh, and actually the diagnosis came after a further investigation after what we found is and the athlete had to stop activity so we actually we started with a performance question we solved the performance question and while we were solving the performance question we highlighted a medical issue that then was followed up and allowed uh, the athlete to be uh, to be looked after properly so this project required a variety of uh, sensors that were placed on the body of the athletes. And there were all sorts of things, but this group uh, used the data to understand um, very peculiar things about training short track speed skating and in particular the need to train two legs in a different way because one leg is very important. To accelerate. And what also allowed us to understand was the big difference between the three Olympic distances and the way they, are, they skate, but also the difference between the male and female athletes, the way they skate and the way the technique should be changed uh, and the way training should be done. So again, questions from performance questions. Uh, this student won uh, a prize, a PhD prize in the United States for uh, the work that was done in this particular case. But it was interesting because uh, all this information really had a big impact on this program. And I think two years later, two of the athletes that were in that program won medals at the world level, sadly never at the Olympic level. Uh, this is another example of uh, actually a study that starts in the lab. Uh, many years ago, I was doing some work on uh, muscle temperature. Uh, at the time, we were interested in understanding what's the effect of making the muscles warm on the force velocity relationship and power output. So we were putting students into uh, water tanks and changing the temperature, measuring muscle temperature. And what we knew very well was that if you make the muscles very warm, uh, they produce more power. Uh, if you make the muscles cold, they produce less power. Uh, and it's due to the fact that uh, you increase the contractile activity and you can uh, have a faster cross bridges cycling so you can affect the shape of the force velocity curve. So uh, the temperature coefficient indicated that uh, plus one there was a thermal dependence and uh, minus one was a negative dependence. So what we found was that there was a positive dependence for power of velocity. Very cool study in the lab but that needs to translate into performance. So uh, later on it is a, a very puzzled me as, uh, experimenting with uh, heated trousers attached to some uh, 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 non-safe uh, units somewhere. So this guy is the performance director of the skeleton team and we are checking if uh, making inserts that make the legs warm can improve uh, power output. A few legs were burned in this exercise uh, sadly as you do but then later on this translates into understanding how we can have an impact on performance of a, a skeleton athlete because in skeleton the start it's the most important thing it accounts for about 55 percent of the final result and it's a sprint that is done for about 30 meters before the sled is loaded the athletes are performing warm-ups 
uh, in the cold. It's, it's a winter sport, so they are outside doing warm-ups. Then when they get to the start line, they take their clothes off uh, and then they have a very thin uh, aerodynamic uh, uh, suit, which is not uh, very good for protecting your body from the cold. Uh, so pretty much they do these warm-ups and then by the time they are on the start line, they get very, very cold. So we, we were looking at solutions to retain or increase the heat and uh, because we knew that had an effect on sprinting and we managed to do that. So this is actually the gold medal winning athlete. Uh, and then the result is that um, she did win the gold medal. She's wearing a full body suit to retain the heat. You can see the video clips on YouTube. And she produced three out of four fastest times in the spring that really made the difference uh, between winning and losing. And of course she did win the medal because she was very good at driving the sled. The sled had special technology, but this is the approach. We were looking for these little 1% changes that could make the difference. And, and we hope that that helped Amy uh, obtain the medal. And later on, this kind of progressed uh, to these trousers uh, that were developed for the summer sports in London 2012. This is Chris Hoy wearing uh, the special trousers uh, for increasing muscle temperature. Uh, and then there was a lot of success. Uh, and of course, the press says that uh, the British cycling team wins because they have hot pants. And uh, actually, they win because they're very good and they do a lot of other things. Uh, that are quite successful, there is a great equipment research going on, but the press likes to attribute uh, success to something that looks a bit odd. Uh, so hot pants was the thing. We extended all this work also to boxing because we knew very well that if you um, cool down too quickly, you decrease power output in upper body as well. So this is one of the Olympic boxers. Uh, after the warm-up, they increase power output, and if they cool down, they decrease power output. And in boxing, it was very important to win points in the first three rounds. So we knew that power output in the first three rounds was important, so we developed garments to retain heat uh, after the warm-up or increase heat in case there was a prolonged warm-up phase. This paper was published as well. Uh, another example was this project again with Skeleton. Uh, in Skeleton, the, uh, as I said, the sprint and the loading of the sled is very important. Uh, it kind of determines for 55% of the performance. So we were looking at how to understand this better, uh, measuring the qualities of the athlete, the force velocity relationship and the power velocity relationship in the gym. But pretty much what we found was that we could use all the tests that were used by the strength and conditioning team. We ranked them. We looked at how many of those tests could explain performance. And we pretty much came back with uh, six tests or six indicators from the tests that were predictive of the performance ability of the athlete. So by analyzing all the athletes on the Olympic program repeatedly, we were able to tell the coaching team to say, okay, if you measure these six things routinely, these six things can predict how fast you're going to be when you load the sled. And we developed the formula for the coaching team to track it. So this helped the strength and conditioning coaches to focus on the important things and the parameters that could improve performance, but also provided the staff with a way of measuring gains and a way of predicting how performance on the ice was going to be. And again, this was published after, uh, after the Olympic Games. So there's a lot that can be done in training. Uh, you know, training, it's, uh, training prescriptions happen with a variety of uh, prescription of training activities and sets, reps, etc. Uh, in reality is that we really need to measure to understand what's happening. And by using science, we can understand why things failed or why things succeed and also keep a good information on what works and what doesn't work for a particular athlete. I'm not gonna bother you with those, but uh, I'm just going to skim through that a little bit to say that observing and, and measuring things in training has been something that we've done routinely and the process helps everyone to understand more what's important to do. Uh, 
The last few things are examples again of practical needs. So this was the preparation for uh, Beijing Olympics uh, in 2008. This is the Weymouth uh, sailing venue. You can see pollution uh, was a big deal and everyone was worried about it. So we had groups of athletes going to China for competition and we were looking at various parameters uh, every day. This is a, a group that was in the US and then flew to China. And you can see the few athletes were really struggling with eye irritation, but also what we noticed in this group was that there was a progressive decrease in uh, uh, forced vital capacity. So we, we could inform the team that actually, yes, it's, it might be an issue in eye ventilation sports, uh, being exposed to uh, pollution. So we really need to do something about it and have an, an individual approach. Uh, nowadays also athletes travel quite a lot around the world. There is uh, athletes in some sports are traveling westwards or eastwards routinely during the year. So understanding how they respond to jet lag, it's very simple to do these days with the technology and but also with the questionnaires and the measurements. So these are types of interventions that are relatively simple to do but can really help athletes prepare better uh, their events. So this was a group that left the UK, went to the US, went to Canada and then came back to the UK. And these are the jet lag symptoms based on a visual analog scale. And you know, we could give them advice individually, but also as a group to when uh, it was appropriate to return to, to proper training, for example. Uh, this, this is actually a funny thing. Uh, it's quite relevant now, of course, because of COVID. But one of the biggest things we had before the Olympics in London was we did a huge campaign called minimizing infection risk because we recognized that one of the biggest risks for athletes was to get ill before the games because they had more contacts with family and friends. And so we know from the science where the risks come in terms of the amount of bacteria that are present in different parts of public toilets, for example. This is an interesting study from Flores in 2001. But we translated all this science into very simple interventions. So we did a big education piece on washing the hands. We did a big piece on educating the family and friends on washing their hands. We had cleaned all the surfaces in the Olympic Village in the areas where our athletes were. Uh, we gave them kit to carry with them. We created a special place outside the village for them to meet their family and friends where we made sure everyone had clean hands. But also we produced very simple material that was uh, available in every room of the athletes or near every toilet to educate and reinforce the messages that cleaning their hands regularly was going to keep the bugs away. And uh, just as I was going through this, I found this fascinating because we received a lot of criticism from the British media at the time when we were doing this because they were accusing us that we were telling athletes not to shake hands with other people. And now has become the norm because of the situation we are in in this pandemic. Uh, helping coaches means helping understand what they do on a daily basis. So science needs to be applied to understand a phenomenon, but also to understand how the individuals within a team or within a squad respond to training sessions. So this is an example of a uh, track and field. Uh, this is, uh, for example, very simple measurements like blood lactate. Athletes doing exactly the same session, but athletes are responding in a different way. So this is the type of information that can help the coach design training better. Data are important. Uh, nowadays, we can measure a lot more than we could before, but Data are always only important if yes, I'm done in two minutes. So data are important if they are stored and they are reported and reviewed. And there are various ways to report uh, data to coaches and athletes so they can intervene. And these are just examples. So uh, how do we use science? What we need to do? It's uh, creating the right environment. Uh, passion, action, love, bravery, willingness to learn. Uh, the key thing is to avoid insanities. 
which means doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So this is, I think, where science can make a, a big impact in sport is helping driving change or helping driving uh, 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 information exchange or helping driving questioning from the coaching staff. So this is the summary of what I covered today. Uh, I think science can help the coaches to be better uh, if you know what you're looking for. It's important to use the best people with the right expertise. Uh, it's important to use data to change things or, or make things better. There is a lot of wearable technology that is coming out on the market and we need to embrace it because this is becoming the norm. Uh, in general, young athletes like technology, so they like to be engaged with that process. Uh, but we need to do a lot more work and, and there is a lot of stuff that we can learn if we work together with different expertise in, in different sports. So thanks for your uh, patience and, and, and your attention. These are my uh, uh, contact details. Uh, so feel free to drop me an email or contact me on Twitter anytime you want. Sorry if I went a few minutes over. So, uh, okay, uh, I will just mute you. Uh, there is a really uh, strong microphone or not anymore. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this lecture. It was really a dynamic presentation. So we already tried and I really liked this this kind of presenting the results, especially when there is a lot of uh, like this uh, picturesque uh, way to show the data that you want to present us. Uh, so uh, I would like just to uh, take a moment before we start with discussion to say a few uh, special hellos today. So first uh, I will start with Professor Roland Barr and uh, Dr. Jarko Vučković who are our previous lecturer from the weeks that uh, follow this lecture for today. So thank you for joining us and supporting the activity of uh, our forum. Uh, and also one special hello to Professor Vlada Ilić uh, from uh, the Faculty of uh, Sports and Physical Education here in uh, Belgrade. He is running their physiology department. Uh, also for the Professor Nicolas uh, Koutanos from the Aristotle University in uh, Thessaloniki. He is also professor of the sports medicine. Uh, also our professor and great surgeon uh, Dragan Radovanovic, uh, who is the president of the Medical Commission in Serbian Olympic Committee and a member of FIBA Medical Commission that has published precise recommendations on the return to sport. And also a uh, great hello for uh, our colleague, Professor of Physiology and Sports Medicine from uh, University of Skopje, Jasvina Punčević gligorska So we have a really a huge audience today here. So uh, people coming uh, from all over the Europe and Asia. So I would like to invite the audience to ask the questions. As you know, there are two ways how to do that. You can uh, click on the participant option and choose, uh, so when the, op the window opens, opens, you will have the option raise hand or you can uh, write down the question into the chat, chat section and I will read uh, that question to the Professor Cardinale. Uh, so we have one uh, hand that is raised, so from Zoran Milovanovic. Okay, Zoran, you can turn your microphone on and ask a question to, to Professor. Uh, thank you, Bilena. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank to Professor Marco for a nice evidence-based lecture. Uh, I really like uh, his approach, uh, but I have one uh, question. It's more like opinion than question. Uh, what I recognize as a problem uh, between science and practice is uh, publication bias. Uh, today we have a very big problem with the publication bias because uh, many journals uh, more likely publish uh, significant res uh, results than uh, non-significant. So coaches and uh, practitioners will always uh, or will have uh, in mind that uh, many 
uh, an example supplements lead to increased performance or an example if i repeat 10 studies in different sports and uh, found uh, non-significant results probably my uh, findings will not be published in uh, any reputable journal so what is your opinion regarding publication bias and how we can solve the problem to have a equal opportunity to publish uh, significant and non-significant uh, findings because i my personal opinion is that both are very important i, I agree um, first of all I, I i'm probably one of the few that has published a lot of papers where i showed that there was no effect of many things so <laughs> I was, You're lucky one. No, I'm, I'm not sure about that because it was a battle to get these things published all the time. I mean, one of the examples I can give you is uh, before the London Olympics, uh, it, it was becoming popular in the UK to use uh, citrulline malate as a supplement, which is a, a derivative from watermelon. Uh, and so we did a study with well-trained cyclists before we were going to the Olympic team. We, we, did, we always did that. Okay, before we go there, we need to see if it works. Uh, so we, we used to have uh, groups of uh, cyclists of good level and then it didn't work. And then we went to the Olympic team to say, don't even waste any time in this because it doesn't work at all. Uh, so they thank us because we saved their time. But, and, we, and then we published the paper eventually um, as well. Um, and it's actually one of the few papers where we also measured the amount of the substance in the supplement, which is something that no one does. <laughs> uh, but I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's a problem, uh, but I think that there's two things to consider. One is if you are working in sport uh, and you are not bothered about publication, like I wasn't most of the times, uh, you use the process to inform the coaches and the athletes. So one of the things I used to say to, to the coaches and the athletes was, okay, you read this paper that says that if you drink beetroot juice you go faster fine let's test it on your athlete to see if it works if it works you take it good if it doesn't work i'll tell you not to spend your money so i think it's the process of science applied in sport needs to be independent from not biased because you need to see if it works or not and also sometimes you need to be open to understand that something that doesn't work in the literature might work in uh, in uh, sport and the mindset also has to be different when you use uh, a statistical analysis. So when we try to analyze data for research purposes, we, we look for a P less than 0, uh, 0.05 or 0 0.01 because we want to be sure or very close to say that the effect is due to the treatment. Okay. But if, I, if I'm a doctor and you are very ill and I come to you and I say, I have this pill, that gives you only 80% chances of survival, would you take it? You would. And that's P equal to 0.20. So I think it's, it's slightly different, the approach when working in a high performance sport, it's using the process to see what's appropriate or not. But in terms of publication, I totally agree with you. And, and I, I, I always try to, especially the negative findings, I try to publish them because to me they are more important than others because then you stop wasting time. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But yeah. it's, it's a battle. It's not easy. <laughs> I agree. Okay, uh, Bilena, if uh, we have time, I would like to ask one more question. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is, that's completely okay. So go yeah. on. Because you mentioned statistical analysis and uh, I would like to ask you about uh, Hopkins' approach uh, related to small worldwide changes. Have you ever used and what is your opinion? Can we use it to judge uh, about uh, performance improvements or not? Uh, I used it for a while and then I reverted back to, <laughs> to probabilistic approaches. I think when I analyze groups, I am more into the probabilistic approach because I, I understand it better probably. Uh, when I analyze individuals, I try to understand first the variability of the measure I have, uh, and then make a call on that, which is a little bit what Hopkins does, uh, you know, the smallest worthwhile change and how much is in and out of it. 
There has been a lot of criticism to this approach recently uh, from Sai Nani. She's written great papers on it. Uh, and I quite like where she's going with it. But at the end of the day, you, you know, it's, um, if you are working with one athlete, one athlete only, uh, and you try different interventions, you, you need to make a judgment sometimes, which cannot be absolutely 100% accurate statistically. So you need to take a bit of a gamble based on the numbers that you have in front of you. So I, I, use bo I would use both, but then at some point the experience and common sense comes. Also because the one thing you should never forget is that some intervention, if the athletes believe it works, and you, uh, it's a strong placebo, and you should always use placebo as well because it works better than most of the interventions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Definitely, we are using the same sources, so we have common opinion regarding uh, that uh, the topics. So thank thanks, you very much. Thanks for the questions. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Zoran, for her questions. So uh, yeah, we have the hand that is raised uh, from Professor Popovich. So Professor, uh, join us. Turn on your microphone and uh, uh, ask whatever you want to the Professor Cardinale. Marco, thank you very much uh, for your excellent <coughs> lecture. And uh, uh, really, you connected uh, science and uh, your pe personal experience on the pitch. Because uh, I agree uh, with you and with the colleagues uh, from Niche that uh, there is lots of published paper that uh, practically they are not helping us. But don't forget uh, one thing, uh, all these people working with the athletes uh, involved in sports science, they have to publish the paper to share their experience. Uh, that is going to oblige them to do a review of the literature and they are going to have uh, better knowledge. And uh, uh, I agree completely with you concerning the position of the coach. Young people today, uh, uh, especially involved in publishing, to, uh, they don't understand the importance of the coach. Yeah. And a uh, uh, few days ago, I have read a fantastic paper uh, from Wall Street uh, Journal uh, that, uh, that was who is the best coach of all the time in the sport. And I was surprised. The title was, that's not the one that you, everybody is thinking. And they proclaim uh, our former, from former Yugoslavia, a coach uh, of uh, Batrapolo, Rudic, who was, uh, uh, yeah, Ratko was uh, because he wins three gold medals. But why I'm talking that, because the coach is like uh, the coach of Bashir, this Pol uh, guy from Poland, they have that, that uh, uh, French people call, call savoir-faire. So they know how to do it, you understand? Because that is in their blood, how to coach. Sometimes they have very difficult to explain. And uh, that is, and once again, Marco, thank you very much because that's a really fantastic uh, uh, presentation that you did. And uh, but I would like to only to to take the, the people take this in consideration and about and uh, about publishing uh, on the uh, 11 June. Uh, Professor Karim Khan is going to be there. They can ask him about publishing the question. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh... So uh, let me see, uh, there is a raised hand by Lana Karazman. Hello, Lana. Hello. Hello, Professor Kardinale. Hello, Hi. Professor Radovanovic, Mazic Radovanovic, Professor Popovic, of course, and Professor Barr. Um, I have some doubt. Can you please help me to resolve it? Many of research done in sports science and uh, also done in uh, uh, sport medicine, of course, I don't separate it, are used um, like some kind of uh, clever doping, maybe, 
you call it support, but uh, is that the clever doping? Because when you improve uh, uh, some professional athlete uh, performance by 1%, that is sometimes uh, medal winning. Don't you agree? Thank you. Yes, I, look, I have to say, my, my experience in the UK was this. Uh, I was fortunate to be there at the time where there was a lot of people, it was a bunch of people that was working on this high performance program and it was really an incredible uh, time because there was a big investment from the government and there were a lot of people, really smart people involved in it. So I, I was one of the many that was involved. And I think that kind of created a, a big placebo effect on the athletes because when the athletes went to the games, they felt they had support that someone else didn't have. You know, simple things like the, the example I showed you with skeleton, uh, mm -hmm. the athlete goes and does something that no one else is doing. And she's convinced that she's got an edge. And maybe that's not the thing that made her win the medal. I, I think there's lots of other things that won that medal. But that created in her that placebo effect. The cycling team in uh, London was hilarious because within two days, uh, everyone from other countries was going to the, uh, there was a shopping center near the Olympic Village. And they were all going there trying to buy these uh, thermal covers that you put into into the okay. socket and they warm up your uh, bed and they were trying to put these things on the legs of the athletes and they didn't understand what they were doing or why they were doing it so I think many performances were actually impaired in their athletes because they didn't if you get too hot for a prolonged period of time it's not a clever idea before you do a sprint on a bike uh, and and the other thing they started to look at I remember the French team did the protest because they said that the wheels used by the British cycling team were illegal. We bought the wheels in France. They didn't know they had a good manufacturer of wheels in France. So this, this is the madness of sport. Uh, I agree with you. If you, if you kind of um, create this environment where athletes feel and coaches feel they are getting something special, they believe it. And the funny thing is that the others believe it too. Uh, and then they it's kind of a boosting effect. If you actually look at the press in the last few years on the British system, it's now gone the other way around. Everyone is now criticizing this continuous search for marginal gains. Uh, and, you know, it kind of, there's lots of dysfunctional things that came out in the press. Uh, so, you know, as you say, it's probably been overemphasized uh, in a way, but it kind of worked. You know, I, when I was going around the world with these teams, um, I saw good practice and bad practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the main difference was that we were very well organized. Everyone knew what the person was doing. And I've seen the same here in Doha. I was in Doha at the World Championships in athletics. I was at the marathon event. And you could see the difference between or the, the endurance events, the walks, you know, a Canadian guy wins a bronze medal in the walking at 40 degrees in Doha. I can tell you why. Because the guy was incredibly organized. They had the race plan. They had the nutrition plan. They had everything. The Japanese team came with everything laid out and they won medals in the heat. And you see other teams arrive with two bottles of water. They had no idea what they were doing. And so this is the thing. If you prepare a plan, the support and everything, you are giving an edge just because you have a plan. And it doesn't matter if the effect is there. So as practitioners, I think you need to think about bringing athletes on the start line in the best organized possible way. And that has an effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we also have a hand that is raised by Professor Sasha Bubin from the Faculty of Sports and Physical Education in Nish. Hello, Sasha, you can- uh, Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, I'm very glad. First of all, dear Professor Cardinal, I would like to congratulate you for this wonderful lecture and to thank to Professor Popovich, Professor Mazic, and to Professor Juric for enabling us uh, participation to this uh, presentation. I'm also very glad about uh, uh, nice comments of Professor Radovanovic and Professor Milanovic Zoran from Nish. 
And uh, I would like just to make uh, a comment. Your presentation reminded me to a presentation of uh, David Epstein. Uh, he made on TED in 2014. And uh, the success of your Bob squad is maybe due to the uh, suits or the help of equipment. I would like to exchange uh, my email with you and to ask you personally on exact data concerning pharmacology, using pharmacology. And uh, uh, for this occasion, I would like just you to make a comment on my perception of uh, collective uh, game. If uh, we focus on soccer and uh, we focus on, for example, German squads, they play uh, with the same rhythm all 90 minutes during the game. They are hard workers. They are the same in, the, in their life. Uh, if we focus, for example, on Brazilian team, they enjoy while playing football. If we compare their quotidian life, they are the same. If we, for example, take British, uh, they are skipping the middle of the terrain. They are aggressing opposite uh, goalkeeper. They are the same as they are in their life. They are aggressors. So uh, without uh, getting in the subtle details of pharmacology, of uh, placebo effect, like said the Zoran Milanovic, that I all agree. Uh, and uh, by the way, I was a professional uh, handball player for 17 years, playing in former Yugoslavia, in Israel and France. So I uh, say it from my personal experience. Uh, maybe we can uh, give you some advice. Uh, Professor Popovich won an um, Olympic medal back in uh, 1972 to help you maybe with the handball team. But uh, can you give a comment uh, on a collective game and that uh, approach that cannot be attributed not, not, neither to pharmacology, neither to, to equipment help uh, as it was uh, concerning suit in, uh, in uh, Bob squad? What is your uh, opinion? I'll, I'll, I'll try to understand the question because I, I'm not sure what you mean by pharmacology. Uh, I hope you don't mean doping, because in that case, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about it. Um, no, maybe. But, but uh, I look, I, my impression is that, um, first of all, the perception on, on team sports is fascinating. You know, everyone says the, the Premier League runs a lot more than the Serie A. Uh, and actually... Um, you know, sometimes when you see some of the games or some of the, the statistics, it's not that different. Uh, it's, a, it's a perception, but uh, it's important to know what the real data say. But I agree with you, in collective sports, um, and I've experienced that, uh, every nation tends to play based on their style of play, their social background you know I, I always remember the way you guys play handball is completely different from the way the Danish teams play handball and it's completely different from the way uh, Middle Eastern teams play handball so it, you know it, it's a combination of uh, uh, team ethos uh, same in water polo you, you know Italy started to win when Ratko Rudic came and, and they started to play like uh, uh, your countries you know um, so yeah there is definitely an element of that there is an element of society and the way people work together and play together, uh, attitudes, especially in invasion games. Uh, but team sports are very complicated. So performance in team sports uh, sometimes is completely independent from any scientific support or clever training or clever nutrition you do. Um, I have seen, in my experience, I have seen teams that were very well trained by really good people and they didn't achieve anything and I have seen teams that were poorly trained they the coaches I'm not sure if they were good at doing anything but they won and, and it's the reason is always that in such sports the skills are a lot more important 
So I, I think collectively the approach to these teams has always to be to preserve health. So if you can put the best players on the pitch, you're always in a condition to play better. So as a medical team or support team, you want the players to be held on the, on the pitch. Uh, and then you want them to be able to stay on the pitch as long as possible and perform at high levels. So all the interventions you can look at are uh, nutrition, uh, the way you prepare them, how they learn about the game, how they can read the game better, but also I can, how can they sustain those high levels of activities and recover quickly between games. So I, I agree with you, team sports are much more complex than individual sports. Individual sports are relatively easy. Thank you very much for your wonderful explanation and I hope I will be able to exchange sure. uh, some data with you uh, in uh, further our further conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Professor Boban. So uh, I will ask more participants if they want to ask questions to Professor Cornell to raise the hand or to uh, send uh, send a message in the chat. So let me see if there is anybody who wants to. Okay, we have uh, Milena Tomovic from Thessaloniki that wants to join and ask you something. Hello, Milena, you can uh, turn on your microphone. Okay, hello everybody. Hello, Professor Cardinale. I would like to thank you for this great lecture. As Biljana said, I'm a sports medicine specialist. And uh, in Serbia, uh, I don't, in Greece, uh, not yet, but in Serbia, the sports medicine exams is, uh, are the part of uh, legislation. So every year we are performing uh, ergospirometry to elite athletes. So we are estimating the maximal aerobic power. And I would like to ask you, do you believe that this parameter, VO2 max, it still can be used for the performance estimation. And uh, does, this, does uh, this parameter co correlate for, uh, with the uh, field performance of athletes? In which sports we can still use VO2 max? Uh, good question. I, I think uh, your system is actually very similar to the Italian system where medical screenings involve ergospirometry and cardiac screening and all the kind of stuff. So. I, I remember that it's still uh, still ongoing. So the answer is it depends. Um, as a general rule for all athletes, um, you know, if, if an athlete is relatively well trained in their sport, um, their VO2 max it's of not much importance. So if you're going to measure football players, handball players that have a decent level of training, their VO2 max is not going to tell you anything about. Uh, their ability to perform, it just gives you a measure of their cardiorespiratory function and they will never reach the peaks of endurance athletes. So it's a, it's a measure, as a measure of health of the cardiorespiratory system, yes. Uh, as a performance matrix, no. Um, but in some sports you might want to know about it. So in rowing, uh, in uh, cross-country skiing, in extreme endurance events, it might give you some indication of the capacity of that individual at that time where you do the assessment. But then to really understand the performance capacity, it needs to, you need to do more specific assessments that are more field-based. So, you know, in, uh, in athletics, for example, yes, aerobic capacity is important, but running economy might be more relevant to understand the potential of the athlete to perform. Um, lactate threshold might be more relevant for um, uh, a cross-country skier, for example, rather than aerobic capacity per se. So it's a yes and no. It's yes to understand their overall health, cardiorespiratory health. It's one of the measurements you need. But in terms of using that for performance predictions, unless it's really an endurance sport, where it's very, very important to have a very high level of VO2 max, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, that was from Milena. Uh, Professor Popo, we still have uh, the hand that is raised. Professor, do you maybe want to join and ask something more? Or 
mistake. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, somebody else from the audience, maybe to, to ask something to Professor Cardinale? Okay, no more raised hands and there is nothing in chat. So, Professor, would you allow me to, to go with uh, maybe one more question for the end? <laughs> Uh, I have read the paper that you published in uh, 2018 that was about the talent national athletes uh, reach their peak performance a little bit later than non-elite uh, one. And that was a huge study that you performed on near 6,000 uh, nas Italian national athletes uh, in, uh, GC, uh, in CGS uh, sports group. Uh, so you have demonstrated that later they go into their stop competition, they actually get better results. And this is uh, starting, uh, it, it is actually making me thinking about uh, the really controversial um, topic about the early specialization in sport. Uh, so uh, this is something that is always discussed by the people from clinics, people from field. And I want to know what is your opinion as uh, the scientist in this sports medicine field. So what do you think about this early specialization? On one side, we have Federer just started tennis at age of 12. We have Tiger Woods that started with the age of three. So what is your opinion about this, this topic? This is, a, this is a fantastic question, actually. I'm trying to open a file because we, we are about to publish another three studies. Uh, we analyzed the top 200 uh, in the world in athletics in different events and also the top uh, 200 swimmers in Europe. And we are seeing exactly the same thing in the young swimmers and the, in the young uh, track and field athletes. But while the file is opening up, uh, I will tell you my view. So the first thing is that um, I think it's the individuals you mentioned are very, very special people. You know, um, Tiger Woods, uh, Federer, um, I can tell you Usain Bolt was already world record holder at age of 14 and 15. Um, who else was quite um, special? Kevin Mayer, which is the decathlon world record holder. Uh, so these are special, special people. Uh, and unfortunately, people remember only the special people. It's easier to say, you know, Tiger Woods reaches the best and say, see, he started early. This is why he got there. Uh, what they forget is that, that for any Tiger Woods that we see, there is probably... 10, 15 Tiger Woods that disappeared. And, and one, one exercise I do sometimes, you know, every once in a while in the press, we see things like, oh, this kid is the new wonder because he wins the, I don't know, the 100 meters uh, at age seven and he's running faster than 10 years old. Or there is a kid in baseball that hit, I don't know how many home runs. So this kind of special kids appear and then a few years later, they disappear. You, you don't know where they are. At. So let's see if I can show you this quickly. So I, I'll show you this, this data that I have from uh, other sports. Um, but we have seen exactly the same in all these CGS sports. So when we analyze, there you go. So I will try to share it now. Let's see if I can. Uh, yeah, you should be able. Yeah, the area started the. Uh, Can, you see it? Can you see the file? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see it. So on the left side, uh, it's uh, the top two hundred in the world. So we we looked at the top fifty in the world that were top fifty under eighteen in athletics in the jumping events, and then the people that were top 50 when they were senior. So up to the age 16, 17, the, the ones that were good at age 18, of course, are better. But then after, they get surpassed by the others. Look at by how much in all the jumping events. And that's both in men and women. And on the right-hand side is in Europe. So the red line is the athletes that were good only as juniors. In green, the athletes that were good as juniors and seniors. And in blue, the athletes that became very, very good only as seniors. So if you look at kids at age 15, 16, and you see at somebody that looks really, really good, then maybe they are not that good. 
Um, so this, this, this is one of the things that we are finding. But in terms of early specialization, I think there are some sports where you have to early specialize. You know, think about gymnastics. There is no way you can become a good gymnast um, later on in life. So there are sports that still require early specialization. What I can tell is that I think sports where it's the, the technical and tactical demands are limited and the physiology is more prevalent, not only is possible to specialize later, but also is possible to transfer. So in Beijing, for example, we had Rebecca Romero won a medal in track cycling. In the previous Olympics, she won a medal in rowing. Uh, uh, and there is a case of many athletes, there is a Canadian athlete, she won medals in rowing and in, um, in cycling and in speed skating. So in, I think in physical events where the physical element is predominant, you can have a late specialization and a transfer. So you can transfer from one sport to another, uh, but in some sports you need early specializing. Well, uh, yeah, so that is really interesting data. And thank you for sharing with us this uh, new one that you are actually waiting to, to publish. So it was really interesting to me when I read, I actually thought that if you are great when you are a young athlete, that is something that will simply follow you during the, the rest of your career. But that was not the case. And this, uh, and I really like this study uh, from 2008 because it was like uh, almost 50-50 male and female. So there was no, uh, the, this gender bias. So data were really um, objective to, to see and to, to research. So thank you for, for this answer. Uh, I would like to also to ask one more time if somebody wants to ask a question to Professor Cardinale. So option raising hand or in the chat section. Uh, so, no. Uh, okay, uh, Professor, so uh, let me thank you once again for uh, making time for us and our forum to uh, represent the data that you have and the recommendations that are up to date. So a lot of questions that our audience had are solved by your lecture and this following uh, discussion. Uh, so just let me to... Uh, to uh, Okay, so I would like to, uh, sorry, there is something in the chat to see. Uh, yeah, this is a thank you note uh, from uh, Bruno Lori. So uh, thank you very much for this interesting topic and for the invitation that he got from the uh, uh, from uh, our team. Uh, so I'd like also to take a chance to invite everybody from today's lecture for the next week. Uh, so the same place, the same time. So Zoom platform at uh, 6 p.m. Belgrade time. Uh, with us will be Professor Dr. Johannes Toll, uh, who is a sports medicine physician and uh, clinical researcher uh, coordinator at Aspetar. And the subject that he is going to share with us is acute hamstring injuries. So uh, I ask you to, to join us. You will receive the invitation letter from me in the beginning of the following week. So you can join us for that uh, lecture. So once again, thank everybody that uh, find time and join us on this webinar. I think that we all learn a lot from Professor Cardinale. Thanks a lot again for uh invite and I hope to visit Belgrade again soon. <laughs> well, we hope that we will uh, going to have you here, that maybe some conference will be organized as soon as we are able to travel freely okay. wherever we want. Okay, okay so. Have a nice evening. Uh, you too. And